We continue going through the book of James. Today we read James chapter 3, beginning in verse 13, and sections of chapter 4. Listen for God's word that is for us in this day. James says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy or selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly and spiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and you do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So today we talk about the good life. And the good life is defined as a philosophical term for the life that one would like to live. It was originally associated with Aristotle. It was quite a while ago. I'm guessing it's been been around as long as time has. Now, Psychology Today has a post about the good life. And in the post, it talks about how people were asked to choose one of four options to define what the good life was for them. Now, the first one was experiencing pleasure. And as I thought about this, I think this is the one that is closest to the idea of paradise. Now, for me, I would picture a white sand beach overlooking crystal blue waters, with a comfortable lounge chair, a good book, and a beverage that one would never consume while pregnant. (laughs) What would it be for you? The second they talk about is avoiding negative experience. And this is a vision or a hope for a life without pain. No aching joints or migraines or back pain, no unrelenting allergies, no surgeries ahead. It's also a life without grief or sorrow, without conflict or arguments, without horribly embarrassing moments, or even without heartache. Now on days when pain is strongly felt and relief from pain is very elusive, this sounds like a very good life. The third one is seeking self-development. And this is a life where one keeps going. Beyond the boundaries and the limits, it's a life that explores and takes in all that is around them. For some, this might be tackling triathlons or extensive travel to see and learn more about the world. For others, it might be learning new languages or staying on top of a new field of study or finding space to actually know oneself. This is a life 
that savors time and doesn't understand why anyone would ever be bored. The last one is making contributions to others. And this is for those who long to make a difference, to do something that matters and that goes on even after they are gone. So in each one of these, experiencing pleasure, avoiding negative experience, seeking self-development, making contributions to others, we can see a glimmer of hope and a view of the good life, yet so often... The good life does feel like it's just out of reach, doesn't it? Here in chapters 3 and 4, James is talking about the good life. He's talking about it in a different way. He's talking about a real good life, one that's not always ahead, but one that we can abide in. And it's not based on stuff or luxury or comfort It's not about paradise or avoiding pain. For James, it's about becoming wise, about becoming truly wise. And so we hear James ask, who is wise? And as we should expect by now, James isn't talking about someone who knows a lot. He's not talking about someone who draws in information and understands it perfectly. James is talking about one whose wisdom is seen by what they do, by how they act. James wants to see it in how we live. So then James goes on to try and help us understand true wisdom. First, he tells us, what isn't wisdom? Anything that acts out of envy or selfishness isn't living into true wisdom. Anyone who thrives on conflict or disputes isn't living a life that is wise. Anyone who is ruled by their cravings is leaning away and not in to what is wise. I think the easiest one of these to talk about is cravings. I tried to search for the most common cravings on Google, but Google is too smart and would only give me sites that were about pregnancy cravings. So... You all are going to have to help. So, we all have different kinds of food cravings, I think, pregnant or not. So just share. Say out loud, what is it that you crave? There's a variety, right? I'm sure they all taste amazing. Whatever it is, it's in your mind or you spoke. But isn't it always so frustrating that so often what we crave really isn't good for us? Why is that? Now there's other things we crave, sometimes to be appreciated, or to have the newest gadget, or sometimes to just be anywhere else. Now the cravings James is talking about are specifically the ones that cause wars within us, things that push or pull at what is and try to force our lives and us to be something else. From that can come actions. From other places we can act out of selfish cravings and envy. We can cause conflict. And these actions reflect wisdom, but the kind that's not from above. James is trying to get us to understand wisdom that is from above. He says that it's pure, not coming out of ambition or selfishness, but seeking to understand all without bias. It is peace-seeking. As the person who seeks what is best for all, it's gentle, not forcing, but working to let the good find space and room to be seen. And it's filled with mercy, able to forgive and not insist on its own way, but being right with oneself, with God, and with one another. A good life is seen by one's sense of peace, 
and knowledge of true fulfillment. It's not things that might be nice but aren't really fulfilling. A full bank account, a closet full of beautiful things, always being right, but by peace and harmony. Focusing on those things that truly matter, the things that remain, those moments that are most meaningful. For a life that is really good and wise draws near to God, and God draws near to them. Now, as we explore this idea of the good life, it's easy to think that it's just about us about us finding the right way for us to live, but it's not. It may start with us, but for James, this is actually about the whole community. Taking last week and this week as we look at chapters 3 and 4, James is addressing these most common problems that happened in the community of the early church. And he does that by looking more specifically at what we say, and what we do. In his commentary on James, Douglas Moe says, James focuses on the problems of dissensions and disputes within the community. And these two issues are naturally related since impure, especially critical speech, almost always accompanies quarrels and arguments. But he is going somewhere with all of this. Barbara Brown Taylor points out that while the book of James has been seen in stark contrast to the writings of the Apostle Paul, both of them arrive at the same conclusion, proclaiming those who truly love God cannot fail to live in peace with one another. Those who truly love God cannot fail to live in peace with one another. Through this whole discussion that James brings in these chapters, it's about what we should say and how we should live good lives because James is trying to lead us towards peace. Sometimes this path feels like it's beyond us, but it starts with us. Consider this story. In Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Harry is new at the school. He's new at Hogwarts. And as he tries to find his way in this new place, he finds this out-of-the-way room that has a mirror. And as he stands before the mirror and looks into it, he sees his parents right there with him. This is what he most longs for, his mother and father who died when he was a baby. He wants to be with them, to know them, to have a family. The next night he brings his new friend Ron, and Ron looks in the mirror, and he sees himself holding this big trophy. As one of many children, Ron is one who longed to find a way to stand out, to be seen at his best in a moment just like winning this big trophy at school. Then one night, Harry goes back to the room with the mirror, and he finds the headmaster Dumbledore there. And he tells Harry about the power of this mirror, that it reflects back one's deepest and most desperate desires. And after it's explained, Dumbledore says, the happiest man on earth would be able to use this mirror just like a normal mirror. That is, they would be able to see himself exactly as he is. This is where James is going with the good life. It's a life where one is at peace with oneself, with God, and with one another. In this week, as we continue to ponder these chapters in James, There's questions to ask ourselves. What are we aiming for in life? What is our goal? What are we hoping will be the end result of life? 
how can we live into this good life that James describes and God offers? How can we draw near to God? May we know and find peace seeking to live lives of true wisdom. Amen.